Do I need to introduce myself? Mm -hmm. uh, you can introduce yourself. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jing Ying Li. I'm assistant professor of modern cultural media at Brown University. Today is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Jason McGrath and moderate his talk. Jason is a distinguished film scholar and thinker who I deeply admire and a dear friend whose friendship has been cherished for years. His work on Chinese cinema and, and its history and aesthetics of various modes of realism has been the inspiration of my own work on Chinese animation and digital media. Jason is a professor of modern Chinese cultural study in the Department of Asian and Media, uh, Middle Eastern Study at the University of Minnesota, where he also served on the graduate faculty in moving image, media, and the sound studies. His first book, Post-Socialist Modernity, Chinese Cinema, Literature, and the Criticism in the Market Age, examined how the post-1980s marketization trend transformed Chinese culture in the contemporary era. His second book, Chinese Film, Realism, and the Convention from the Silent Era to the Digital Age, which just came out from Univers University of Minnesota Press this year, and according to Jason, there's a 40% of um, which code he will offer for us. Um, the second book traces the history of mainland Chinese fiction film through the various claim for cinematic realism made over a century of cinema in China, describing a historical dialect of realism and convention in which realism defined itself both through and in, op in opposition to conventions of various sources, whether those indigenous Chinese drama, classical Hollywood cinema, melodrama, socialist realism, new realism, or contemporary block uh, blockbuster cinema. Today, Jason will discuss Zhang Yimou's film Shadow um, on the notion of national style and analyzing its CGI, uh, CGI technique. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Jason McGrath. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, and I likewise am a longtime admirer of both Professor Lee and Professor Du's work. And uh, I feel in a in a speaker series on animation, I feel like I'm the amateur here among two uh, of our leading experts in the field. So I appreciate your uh, feedback today and your forbearance. Um, my talk today, as the title says, is focused on Zhang Yimou's film Shadow from uh, 2018. And I'm particularly looking at his use of CGI and uh, in, in part as an update of styles of animation that have a long history in China. Um, I, sorry, I need to... Um, trying to figure out how to advance my PowerPoint. Oops. Can you still see the PowerPoint? Oh, you can't? Oh, no. Okay. Give me one second. Can you see it now? Oh. Okay. Is it, does it look right? Or do I need to full screen it? It's okay, but I think if you full screen, maybe it looks better. Okay, let me see. Okay, yeah, now it's working. Does this look right? Not full screen, but I think you can just maybe click individual, and it's probably easier to click individual uh, slides. Oh. Um, it's okay now. Okay. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Sorry. 
Um, so, so I, what I would like to do is analyze the film in terms of uh, a few different things, and I'm just going to go through them. And I am I welcome you know feedback or uh, questions or input, of, especially of people who saw the film on any of these matters. But first, I'm going to talk about uh, this film in terms of the aesthetic of CGI animation and uh, how that can be understood with reference to traditional Chinese ink painting. Uh, and I will also talk about the martial arts style represented in the film and its references to Taoist philosophy. And then I want to talk a little bit about one thing I find most curious about this film, which is the themes of gender reversals and androgyny that you can find in the film. And then finally, I'll conclude with a discussion of how this film, in my opinion, forms a sort of um, dramatized, but also a sort of film theoretical rejection of cinematic realism on the part of Zhang Yimou, and maybe gives us some clues about his aesthetics in general throughout his career. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of things that inform my reading. Um, and one is, oh no, now once again, okay, there we go. Um, one is to reference my book that was just published because I'm I'm trying to sort of continue some arguments that are in the book but the book does not discuss this film at all. So um, as Professor Lee mentioned, the book is Chinese film realism and convention from the silent era to the digital age. And here there's a link to the open access edition of this. So in, anybody can read the full book for free, including with more than a hundred extra features, in particular, more than 80 film clips. So any, any scene that's discussed at any link in the book has a film clip in the open access edition that can be referred to. In any case, in that book, which is really a history from the silent era to the digital age, but the final chapter, chapter seven, is specifically on Chinese cinematic realisms in the digital age. And this is a quote from that chapter. Um, Chen Shiha published an article um, that celebrated the post-filmic world of digital cinematography. And in that essay, which would soon be canonized by its addition to the two-volume anthology, Selected Works of 100 Years of Chinese Film Theory, Chun praised computer imagery for providing filmmakers with a new genuine freedom in which cinema no longer rests on a foundation of ontological realism. And he says, digital imagery leads to the collapse of Bazan's ontological theory of the image. As the digital image seizes the primary role in production, in fact, any image at all becomes possible. As a result, verisimilitude is no longer the goal. And instead of photographic ontological realism, post-filmic cinema will be based on what Chun called the virtual realism of the artificial image. So uh, just to briefly review the stakes of this, I think probably most people listening now uh, are already well aware, but just to briefly review, what he means is the sort of the idea in classical realist film theory, people like Andre Bazin and Siegfried Krakauer, that, that the fundamental nature of the film medium is a realism based on its so-called ontological or indexical relationship to the real world, to external reality, and that the power of cinema is to reflect the real world through the, the ability of any photographic medium to record the real world directly because light reflects off the real world and records itself originally on a film strip, and then we see that direct recording. So it's an idea that there is a fundamental connection between the image and reality, and that the image is dependent upon reality and results from reality, and that that is the power of cinema. So this is a fundamental uh, basis for theories of cinematic realism, as many of you know. 
And it's something that arguably for people like Chen, Chen Shiha and other Western theorists as well is supposed to have been fundamentally challenged by the switch to digital cinema, and in particular, the possibilities for computer generated imagery, um, which in other words, where the idea that all of cinema now can be in principle animated rather than realist. Um, so that's one of my touchstones. Another is, oh, I'm sorry, another is from the same chapter. Um, I make the argument uh, that according to Julie Turnock, films that feature a composited mise-en-scene whether using CGI or other digital or special effects, even pre-digital special effects, can be divided into two contrasting trends, a photorealist aesthetic on one hand and an obviously animated look on the other. The former constructs images that emulate the look of live action photography, giving the illusion that what is seen actually was photographed in the real world. Or in other words, it's imitating the ontological realism of the photographic image, even if it's not actually a photographic image, it's purely animated or CGI. Whereas the latter uh, trend or aesthetic, the animated look, creates an obviously fantastical, even cartoonish world that does not pretend to have been photographed in the traditional live action sense. So some CGI blockbusters from China do go for the more photorealist aesthetic. One example I would give would be The Wandering Earth 2, which came out this year, which I believe very, very successfully goes for the same type of photorealist CGI aesthetic that Western science fiction films like, for example, um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey goes for, for example. On the whole, though, my argument is that it seems that more Chinese filmmakers prefer the animation aesthetic rather than the photorealist aesthetic in their use of CGI. And in the book, I reference Zhang Yimo and say Zhang Yimo's visual style, for example, always has been readily described as painterly. And the CGI in films like Hero aims as well for expressionistic beauty more than the illusion of reality. So here I'm sort of uh, continuing that argument about Zhang Yimou with reference to Shadow. Um, another key reference point for me, though, is precisely Professor Du's, um, I think, instant classic and foundational work in our field on Chinese animated animation called Animated Encounters, Transnational Movements of Chinese Animation, 1940s to 1970s of which I'm sure um, all of you are quite well aware. And in particular, her chapter three that I'm just showing an image from here, International Style and National Identity, Ink Painting Animation in the Early 1960s. Um, and so Professor Dupe begins this chapter with this paragraph. National style is prominent in Chinese animated films that use traditional Chinese artistic, literary, and cultural forms materials and techniques, such as Peking opera, paper cutting and paper folding, ink painting, folk Chinese, folklore, Chinese, classical literature, to construct a putatively pure, authentic, and unique Chinese identity. This identity distinguishes Chinese animation from its counterparts in other countries, Japan and the US in particular, and more important, articulates nationalistic sentiments and national pride in defiance of foreign influence and dominance. And in this chapter, she looks in particular at ink painting animation as part of this um, national style form of Chinese animation. And uh, Professor Du looks in particular at, at these two classic Chinese ink painting animated films from the 1960s, Little Tadpoles Look for Mama and The Herd Boy's Flute. And you can see from these still images how they draw on the ink painting style. Um, and the reason this is um, important for Shadow is that it is very much done, even though it's a film, uh, it's not animated, it's partly live action, it's composited, but it's very much drawing on Chinese ink painting aesthetics. For example, in an essay about the film, 
uh, Chinese film critic Li Kunlun has written that, quote, as an art form, film is an important carrier that reflects social ideology and national cultural spirit and praises Zhang Yimou for departing from his previous emphasis on rich colors in his visual style, and instead in shadow drawing on the aesthetic of traditional ink painting with its color palette, mostly of black and white and shades of gray, and its technique of leaving blank spaces or liu bai. Um, another Chinese article on the film by Sun Hua Jian and Li Huan Qin similarly explores the ink painting aesthetic in shadow, noting that, quote, compared with colorful Western painting, Chinese ink painting is simplified with black and white bearing the mystery of Chinese yin and yang, which is very relevant for this film, as we will see later. So these references to Liu Bai and yin yang uh, show how the ink painting style is perceived as connecting not just to traditional Chinese art, but even to the Chinese philosophical tradition. We can see this from the very beginning of Shadow with the title um, frame uh, or the title shot, which I will show you now. So you can see how the look of liquid running ink makes clear from the opening image of the film that the aesthetic is not just one of black and white because the film feels almost like a black and white film. The main colors you see in the film are people's skin and blood, um, but almost everything else is in some shade of black and white or gray. Um, so it's, it's, the aesthetic is not simply black and white, but more specifically ink painting. Um, so you can see in the film, especially in the extreme long shots that have landscape in the background, how much it's imitating uh, Chinese traditional landscape painting. So I'll just show a few examples here. <clears throat> um, besides the... Um, the landscape painting or what you know what traditionally was called shan shui hua and then in the 20th century what became guo hua became nationalized sort of considered explicitly as a national form as guo hua um, besides those elements of the film there are also costumes and set designs that very much continue the animated aesthetic or i'm sorry the uh, ink ink painting aesthetic and uh, a lot of use of calligraphy, as you see here, this is the inside of the palace <clears throat> of Pei Kingdom, which I'll, I'll give you a plot summary in a moment, but, uh, or the, um, this is also, these are semi-transparent panels that fill the palace with uh, painting and calligraphy or the costumes. Uh, like this is the what the King of Pei is wearing at the beginning of the film. And I think these also show us that um, the film does not at all try for historical accuracy. It more uses Chinese tradition as a jumping off point for some very inventive design, set design, costume design, and so on. Um, so many critics have noted how the film is only very loosely based on history, specifically the battle of Jingzhou during the Three Kingdoms era, but it has many invented characters and situations. Um, the plot of Shadow, I have to say, contains so many radical implausibilities that it often borders on being a little nonsensical. Um, then again, it's a Zhang Yimou film, and that's also often the case with his films. Um, so I will try here just to give a brief plot summary for those who haven't seen it or don't remember the film well, although it's a, an extremely convoluted plot, so it'll be hard for me to do it justice. But my brief summary is that the Yang Kingdom has defeated the Pei Kingdom and now controls the fortress city of Jingzhou. Citizens and officials of Pei long to take the city back, but it is protected by the master swordsman Yang San, who defeated the military commander of Pei, Zi Yu, 
in a duel, leaving the latter permanently disabled with a wound on his chest that will not heal. However, it turns out that Ziyu's uncle had abducted a look-alike double for Ziyu, the commander, when both Ziyu and the double were still children, and the double, who has been named Jingzhou after the capital captured city, has been raised to secretly take the commander's place if necessary. Since the commander is now gravely wounded, Jingzhou has been serving in his place as his so-called shadow. So this is how the, the film gets its name, even maintaining a matching wound on his chest, apparently without the King of Pei or anyone else except the commander and his wife knowing about the substitution. Now Jingzhou or slash Ziyu, um, the two, you know, the, the original commander and his double, played by the same actor, of course, have challenged the master swordsman Yang to another one-on-one -on -one duel, which is actually a trick to launch a secret attack to take back the city. So the shadow, Jingzhou, is uh, create training in secret with Ziyu and his wife, Xiao Ai, to participate in the duel. During this time, Jingzhou and Xiao Ai have developed a mutual attraction that is illicit because she's the wife of the real commander, not his shadow or double. Meanwhile, the King of Pei has tried to pacify the master swordsman Yang of the rival kingdom by offering his own sister, Qingping, to swordsman Yang's son as his concubine, although Qingping is furious with the arrangement and seeks revenge. But the son accepts the arrangement and sends his own personal dagger to Pei, to the Pei kingdom, as a token to seal the agreement. And if that sounds convoluted, it's actually a somewhat simplified. The, the film is even more convoluted than that. But in any case, uh, the we are told that legend says Swordsman Yang's great saber was forged by a master blacksmith on the night of a full moon, and it's destined to take hundreds of lives. So the rival is this master swordsman Yang, from the rival kingdom who is said to be the greatest swordsman around and who has a great saber that is almost invincible. Um, so there's some iconography in Shadow that I want to briefly reference. Um, and it's the importance of the iconography of, of Taiji Tu or what's generally known in English as the yin yang symbol in the film. Um, so here are some examples of that. There's a, a board where they that they use for divination um, that's shaped in the the Taiji Tu symbol. Um, and then there's this practice space. This is the space where um, Jingzhou, the the shadow, is training for the duel with Swordsman Yang, and it has the same shape as you can see again here. And this is noted when they go to the duel, this is Swordsman Yang and his son who observes that's a Taiji diagram on the deck. And this is referring to this gigantic raft that floats up to the city to stage the duel that will ensue, which also of course has this Taiji Tu symbol. Um, and during the duel on that raft, we cut back to the practice space seen here where uh, actually the, um, the commander and his wife are playing uh, their zithers during, so it cross cuts between this Taiji Tu and the other one during the final duel um, in dramatic Zhang Yimou fashion. Um, And you can see the duel here. So, um, so now I'll show you some of the training that they're doing. So what they're doing, again, is trying to train the shadow, Jingzhou, to be able to, if not defeat, then at least draw Swordsman Yang into a long enough battle that they can make a sneak attack on the city. So here we'll see the training. So on the left here with the staff, is um, the actual commander who's now sick. And then uh, on the right is his double, the shadow. And this is 
the first sequence of their train. <sighs> So you can see how Jingzhou like rushes in with great aggression and force with his umbrella and is very quickly defeated. This is the second uh, training um, mat. So once again, Jingzhou sort of flails aggressively in with his umbrella and is quickly defeated. Um, so he doesn't seem to, to have figured out how to attack um, the commander, or here it's the, the, the commander is the stand-in for Swordsman Yang. So then there's this key moment in the film where the wife, Xiao Ai, says, let me try. I've watched you many times. I think I've figured out a thing or two. Pay umbrellas are soft and flexible. They work best in the rain. They are water weapons. Water is yin. Yang's moves are hard and fierce. He's like fire. Fire is yang. Yin counters yang. Water puts out fire. Therefore, wield it with feminine moves. And now she will demonstrate what she's talking about. So by, by this yielding technique, she is able to withstand the attack of Yang and to win the round. So, so they quick, of course, we are never told how she got this training or anything like that. Again, there are many implausibilities in this film. Um, but, but then she teaches Jingzhou how to do this type of move. So this becomes the first of a series of trainings in this new, like soft in style of, of uh, fighting that they're going to try to use to defeat Yang. So here is uh, when she trains Jingzhou by him just holding the umbrella with her and feeling her movement. This <laughs> is
<laughs> so, of course, this sort of style, while, while the sashaying attack and so on may look a little silly, this idea of a soft style of martial arts overcoming a hard style, of course, does have a legitimate basis in the Chinese martial arts tradition, in particular in Tai Chi Chuan. Um, so, for example, Xiao Ai says, water is yin, yang's movements are hard and fierce. He's like fire, fire is yang, um, water puts out fire. Um, the uh, Tai Chi Chen treatise, or a commentary on the Tai Chi Chen treatise by Chen Wei Ming, a uh, Tai Chi master, um, goes as, as uh, the, the quote here says, my opponent is hard, I am soft. This is called yielding. I go along with my opponent goes against. This is called sticking. If the opponent is hard and I am hard, then the two of us are mutually resistant. If the opponent is hard and I am soft, then we will not impede each other. By not impeding him, I can then yield and neutralize. When I yield and neutralize, if the opponent's strength misses the mark, he goes against. If my position finds the mark, I go with him. If I go with and stick to where he goes against, then though he has strength, he cannot use it. So this is a classic of Tai Chi Chuan um, uh, uh, philosophy or, or training um, that has roughly the philosophy that she's using. Um, and also, the there is, while fighting with umbrellas may seem a little strange, particularly to Western audiences, um, I'm just going to skip ahead. Uh, There is a precedent for that as well. Uh, there's there is an actual Taiji umbrella form, which is based on the Taiji Chuan sword form, but using umbrellas instead. So you can see through this just this is just a video of people practicing in a park, but you can see that there there is a legitimate style using an umbrella and even twirling it in the way you saw in the video. So um, in the film, though, they also use the umbrellas for more uh, radical kinds of moves. For one, when they when it becomes a group attack, um, they use the same style, but now their umbrellas have blades in them, so it becomes far more deadly. But you, can, you can see here, once they train an army of people to do this, how that, those moves get repeated. So they also fire off their um, blades as part of their attack. Um, So needless to say, when the film gets into things like this, 
It has nothing to do with legitimate Taiji Chen or martial arts, but is rather one of Zhang Yimou's sort of fantasies and also his use of CGI to create these incredible spectacles that don't have much basis in reality. Um, but getting to the duel itself, this is when uh, Jingzhou is actually du dueling with the swordsman of Yang, and you can see how he successfully uses the technique that he's trained for to win round two. And one thing that's curious about this is the army of people that they train to do this. We're told uh, that this is a group of convicts who are sentenced to death, and they are hiding in the forest, and they're all trained in this technique. Um, one thing that I find fascinating about this film in, it's only in the visual iconography, but they're described as this group of people are described as um, as gentle and eccentric, or inro, uh, the same adjective that's used to describe the martial arts style. And one thing I find fascinating about it is how they're depicted as very androgynous. Like the in some of these images, you can't even really tell are these men or women, or are they you know, just are they trans? You know, it's there's a kind of radical androgyny to the army uh, just in its iconography. And this relates to other themes of gender in the film that are kind of fascinating. For one thing, the dagger that Commander Yang's son sends to the Pei Kingdom to seal taking the Pei King's uh, sister as his concubine comes back later in the film when the offended sister uses it as sort of, you know, it's clearly a phallic symbol, uses it to kill him. So part of this whole theme of gender reversal and androgyny is the reverse wielding of the phallic symbol of the blade. Uh, there's even, it's hard not to notice the wound that both Jingzhou and the commander who he is, who he's sh the shadow of, have this wound that almost has the look, a uh, genitalia look to it. Uh, and again, part of this role reversal or gender reversal. And here we have a climactic moment. And again, I can't get into all the plot details, but the commander uh, has killed, has attacked the king of Pei in his attempt to become the king himself. And there are multiple dramatic reversals at the end, but uh, the shadow here uh, is is facing off against um, the commander for whom he is the shadow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So part of the weird sexual politics of the film is that the shadow just before the dramatic battle that we just saw parts of uh, actually uh, has sex with the commander's wife. We could see earlier that they're flirting and not only do they have sex on his final night before the battle, but the commander actually spies on them. So there's this weird voyeuristic theme where he's watching his wife have sex with his so-called shadow. And then in the, uh, the scene we just saw <clears throat> where um, the shadow kills the commander, in his dying moments, he has this death mask placed on his face and he can see through it. And he actually can see through one eye, he sees his shadow. Through the other eye, it shows a flashback of the shadow and the wife having sex, which is a very strange <gasps> for the visuality. <gasps> <gasps> okay. Um, and so I want to end with this quote from the film. The commander, after stabbing the king of pay, the commander says, did you all expect my head to be in that box? Because uh, the, the king thought he had had uh, the commander assassinated and that his head was in a box but it turns out that was somebody that there's no head in the box and the commander stabs the king he says there's something everyone in pay knew sadly the king never figured it out i am the heaven of pay kingdom without the real form how can there be a shadow and then after jing Zhou stabs the commander he counters Commander, without the real form, there is still a shadow. You should have understood this long ago. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And just, uh, I want to really draw on that last quote to relate it back to the aesthetics of the film and this question of CGI and whether there's, uh, whether ontological realism is a basis for cinema and, uh, if you think of a shadow, a shadow is an ultimate indexical sign, right? A shadow only results from the actual presence of the thing casting the shadow. So the shadow is a typical sign that has an ontological relationship to the reality uh, because the shadow can only exist with the real thing. But in this quote, he's saying, no, the shadow can exist without the real. And I am arguing that this is also what Zhang Yimou is saying in this film, and actually in a lot of his films, about the use of CGI and about a formalistic style that does not embrace realism or the idea of film as an essentially uh, ontologically realist medium, but instead insists that you can create a reality, a virtual reality, without the real, without reference to the real. And that's the foundation of his style. And also maybe um, a, a way that he refers back to a, a more formalist or, or expressionist Chinese aesthetic rather than a modern realist aesthetic. Okay, I will end there because I think I've already gone over, a little over time, but thank you. And I welcome your comments or suggestions. Thank you, Jason, for uh, such a rich talk about the um, seeing, making it to being aware of the connection between a pre-modern quote unquote tradition of the Xu, the, the martial art, the Taoist virtual in relation to the postmodern, post cinematic virtual in the CGI. Um, we now open to question. You can put your question in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, before that, I may, uh, if I may, I want to maybe read some comments and questions. Um, that's uh, very much inspired by this amazing talk. Um, as I mentioned here, you, I do see you are trying to make this effort to connecting between the China's pre-modern quote unquote tradition of the the Taoist um, Xu with the uh, post-modern post-cinematic CGI. But what, what I did see also kind of um, the omission or the tension with the cinematic realism as the signature of the modernity. The modernity and all the Chinese called history of mod modern is a completely omitted from this history from the pre-modern Tao or tradition or painting to the postmodern CGI. So first, of course, I wonder what is the history of modernity, the modern history 
socialism and the um, early classical cinematic realism venture into. And particularly, I think there is a tension between the claim of quote unquote, the disappearance of the purity or the authenticity of the realism in the post cinematic age, that is cinematic realism or classical realism is gone. However, the simultaneous claim that the purity and authenticity of Chinese tradition is now reappear in the CGI form. So when wonder how is the realism, which is, has probably only a hundred year history, the cinematic realism, which readily can be claimed to be declined in the post-cinematic age, but at the same time, the so-called tradition, which probably hundred or thousand years, a claim to be quote unquote classic, timeless, non-changing and essential. So the question will be how history, historicity figure in this claim of the so-called tradition. And whether, of course, what tradition's history is, that tradition has a history. Where does history figure in this claim of quote unquote tradition? And my second question is, where you claim this pure, authentic, and ahistorical notion of tradition, and whether or not that's already countered with your argument about realism as quote unquote composited in the digital or cinematic age. I think the idea of the composited realism is very much fascinating. We wonder whether tradition itself is also, or at least composited to a certain way, at least in, in regarding to Chinese animation style, the notion of the national style has been claimed, uh, has this been criticized by uh, many scholars such, such as Sean McDonald or someone, I think there's another one in the special issue I edited. For people like Sean McDonald, the quote unquote national style in Chinese animation was never a purely authentic style, but rather is a political discourses, right? In the social era, there's not a single thing that could be claimed as national style. The national style is composited form that has a lot of modernist style already in it. There actually a lot of study of the, um, the water and paint animation is actually more modernist than traditional because they're already incorporating a lot of modernist the painting and the modernist cinematic animation technique in it. In particular, even Chinese quote unquote traditional painting since the 19th century has already been incorporating um, and adopting the modernist Western painting style, particular in the 20th century um, water, uh, ink and water painting artists such as uh, Qi Bai Shi and Xu Pei Hong are uh, famously uh, more a modernist painter incorporating the Western modern style into the water and the ink painting. So the so-called Chinese traditional painting was never an ahistorical, essential or classical form of tradition, but rather always a composited form with multiple style, multiple historical transformation, including the Western painting as well. And with this notion of composited to my third question that is a story itself, I wonder whether the story itself is allegory of this tension between the purity, the claim of the purity of the tradition versus the very like of purity of the tradition as a such, because I think the story is about the relationship between the replication, right? The replication, displacement, and the pseudo pseudo in desk copying, I guess, right? That this is no real shadow, but the shadow is a replacement of the like of the very real. So when the story itself is allegory or something already gone, the something, the so-called tradition is this, you know, the, the, the disappearance of a king replaced by the shadow that does not need the original thing to exist. If cinematic realism is the one that is gone, replaced by the CGI shadow, I wonder, whether the so-called tradition, be it martial art or water in the painting or the national style, is similarly like cinematic style already gone and recomposited in the CGI as a shadow, as something was only maintained in the pseudo virtual and the fetishistic form in Zhang Yimou's cinema. So that's my question and comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's a wonderful uh, comment. And uh, in, in my broader analysis of this, I precisely would uh, want to put this type of rhetoric, um, whether it's Zhang Yimou himself, and of course, there's a long history of Zhang Yimou, you know, you know, questioning his position vis-a-vis -vis, like contemporary assertions of Chineseness or of Chinese difference or of, you know, the, of geopolitics of the world today. 
um, you know, with like the criticism of hero and so on, um, that it's it to me it it goes without saying almost that what we're talking about here is the contemporary invention of tradition. And I don't at all mean to argue that this is Chinese tradition, but that this is a reinvention of tradition in contemporary cinema. And so the question that it raises is also, what does this type of style, if if I'm correct, that some Chinese filmmakers, at least like Zhang Yimou, prefer a more animated aesthetic and a rejection of the aesthetics of realism in favor of um, a, a revival of what they consider to be a, a revival of, of Chinese traditional, you know, expressionist or xia yi rather than xia shi aesthetics, that we have to situate that in terms of contemporary cultural debates and in terms even of the relationship between Chinese cinema and Western cinema in the competition for audiences. And we would have to put this kind of style also in the context of, you know, a resurgent nationalism and what it means to claim this type of tradition in cinematic aesthetics and, and in the process to reject, for example, the May 4th era embrace of, you know, modern realism as, as the aesthetic for a modern uh, uh, culture. Um, so clearly this all has to be situated in, in this contemporary cultural discourse of tradition or the contemporary invention of tradition for audiences today. Um, and and for me, it, it's it's absolutely the case that this can't be taken at face value. That we're not seeing Chinese tradition unproblematically un depicted in the film. We're seeing it reinvented and reimagined and actually articulated and in, it sort of invented on the spot for contemporary audiences. Um, so, so the yeah, the the question would be, how does this play into a broader cultural politics, and even a cultural geopolitics, and in the context of competition for audiences? Um, so, this is obviously of ever greater importance as Chinese the Chinese film industry competes for the largest film audience in the world, which is in fact the Chinese audience. And we might see this type of rhetoric, this type of visual rhetoric or aesthetic rhetoric as a positioning of Chinese cinema to compete for audiences by claiming a more of a connection with tradition. And for example, in the, the critics that I quoted, they, they more or less accept it at face value. They praise the film for its use of Chinese tradition and for its connection to the so-called traditional aesthetics or philosophy. Um, so I think in that sense, the film is successful if it elicits this type of response in Chinese critics and Chinese audiences and, and maybe then can outcompete something, you know, a, a film from Hollywood or even a film like The Great Wall, you know, which was a failed attempt to compete for global audiences. So I, I completely agree. And, you know, if I had had more time, I would have sort of backed away from the film itself to talk about these broader stakes in terms of cultural politics and in terms of the contemporary invention of tradition. So I think it maybe just uh, another way seem to does in that kind of discursive reinvention of tradition, it indeed seemed to echo with the uh, socialized the era's uh, celebration of national style in animation, because for that is also the tradition was used as a discourse for claiming the so-called national distinctiveness, a uh, distinguished distinctiveness of the Chinese animation. So it's more discursive than the actual um sort of tracing or the indexical tracing of the tradition. And also I wonder if that's Chinese and unique because you do see that, for example, I study Japanese animation. It's very similarly in Japanese anime, the claim of Edo tradition and the claim, the similar claim like what you just like what you did, particular people like uh, Takeshi uh, Murakami claim the uh, super, super fly style in anime is the sort of reinvention of the Edo tradition. And of course, in a similar way, uh, connecting between the pre-modern Japan to the post-modern, post-cinematic style. And people like, of course, Thomas Lamar has offered a lot of critical analysis of this kind of uh, discourse of this 
pseudo continuity between the pre-modern style to the post-modern post-cinematic aesthetics. So I think in a similar way, you can see that it's not specifically, if it is a geocultural claim, it's not specific to China, right? It can be in many other places, particularly in Japan, and today maybe even more so in Korea. And also I wonder if uh, something like um, this kind of aesthetic is that uh, spread, because I do see today a lot of CGA animation, for example, in the Dashen Guilai or White Snake or Neoja, the celebrates in particular how they're like Hollywood. Like it is like compete with Pixar, it is realistic, even though it is animation, not CGI live action film, but it claim it has more of a verisimilitude, the lighting, the shadow, the voluministic uh, uh, dimensionality is realistic, is on par with Hollywood style like dream work of Pixar. So how do you think about that tendency that a lot of audience and the um, and the critic even celebration, the realistic uh, uh, effort, even in animation? Yeah, I, I, think, I think both things are happening at once. There's a, a competition to do um, even like Hollywood style animation or CGI as well or better than Hollywood. And the, you know, the Wandering Earth 2 is a great example of that. There's nothing about the CGI in that film that feels, you know, like it's asserting some connection to some idea of Chinese tradition, but it is as impressive as any science fiction film coming out of Hollywood today in terms of its realist CGI aesthetic. So I think, I do think both are happening at, at once. There's the, the sort of effort to create animated and CGI uh, products that are just as good as the, anything from Hollywood or elsewhere at doing that kind of aesthetic. And there's the approach like this of asserting the Chinese style. And I think your point about the, the 1960s films is a great one. And I, my, my thinking, and, you know, I would, uh, of course, Professor Du could, could say whether this is an oversimplification, but, but arguably the idea of a national style in the late 50s and early 60s is quite related to the Sino-Soviet split and to the need to distinguish Chinese cultural products from as not just an imitation of Soviet socialist realism, but as having a distinctive Chinese, you know, characteristic. And, and maybe this is sort of a revival of the same sort of cultural strategy of, of reinventing tradition within cinema in order to distinguish Chinese cultural products in the Chinese market and also sort of in the global um if not market, then at least the global gaze. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Daisy or anyone else, um, question or comments? Um, is there any questions from the audience? Um, if no questions from the audience, may I ask a question? Um, hi, Jason, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. So in the beginning of your uh, talk, you mentioned uh, two kinds of uh, aesthetics, right? So the one is animation aesthetic, and the second one is a photorealist aesthetic. And you try to argue that the Chinese CGI is more oriented towards the animation aesthetic. Um, I was wondering if you could you know, unpack uh, your argument a little bit further, maybe just giving us uh, a couple of examples, for example, like the American you know, CGI and how the American CGI films uh, try to reinforce the photorealistic aesthetics. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't know much about you know, the American um, um, film industry, the CGI films, but if you could give us a kind of um, a several examples um, to show why Chinese CGI has the tendency towards the animation aesthetic. And uh, maybe you can move beyond Zhang Yimou and especially martial arts films. Do you see um, um, the, the, the prominence of animation aesthetic in other Chinese CGI films? Um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I, my answer, I should, I should begin by saying, these are always going to be over generalizations that we could find many counter examples. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my thinking is always film artists always have access to global influences 
and always can make use of the tools that they have in inventive ways and can imitate uh, what they see from anywhere. So I always reject any idea that, for example, even the earliest Chinese filmmakers, that they were in any way uh, hampered by so-called, you know, traditional Chinese aesthetics that the, that made it difficult for them to embrace the technology of cinema. Because I don't, I think once they're trained in in making films, th the whole world of possibilities is open to them, and they have the technical skills to do what they want. So there are always going to be exceptions. But the argument I make, um, the other examples I give about um, that this could be a, a a tendency in Chinese filmmakers. The the other examples I give are Stephen Chow, mm -hmm. who often uses a very sort of cartoonish animated aesthetic. Um, and then I also talk about uh, the not Wandering Earth 2, but the first Wandering Earth. And I compare it to the American film Interstellar. So these are both science fiction films. They were made within a few years of each other. They have even similar plots in some ways about the earth dying and needing to go find a way for humanity to survive outside the solar system. They both have themes of like uh, father relationships with, with uh, children. Um, so there are, they have a lot of similarities. But for example, in Wandering Earth 1, it makes radical use of the virtual camera. The camera is always going through positions that a real camera could never have. Going through walls, uh, there's one shot that starts on earth underneath a moving truck, and then it keeps tracking out virtually until eventually you're seeing the whole solar system but it's one continuous shot. So it's something a real camera could never ever do. And that's an example of embracing the obviously animated aesthetic because it's not pretending to be a shot that a real camera could actually achieve. Whereas in Interstellar, there are all these shots, like when it's showing spaceships going through space, it seems like the camera is actually attached to the spaceship, what I call an imaginary GoPro camera, um, where, and actually, I think I presented some of this in, in your uh, animation conference a couple of years ago. Um, so, but that's another example of, it's a different, it's not drawing on Chinese tradition, but it's definitely in Julie Turnick's terms, it's the animated, obviously uh, not a real camera aesthetic versus pretending to be what a real camera could capture. So I think there are um, other examples like, um, but, you know, of course, there are also many counterexamples, like Wandering Earth 2, I think, does not fit my hypothesis. Um, so so it, I definitely would not make a blanket statement, you know, Chinese filmmakers are this way and Hollywood filmmakers are this way. But I do see an attraction among some Chinese filmmakers to embracing the possibilities of CGI without trying to stick to a sort of photorealist aesthetic in their animation or in their CGI. But isn't this virtual camera impossible camera? If I remember, I think I remember Xu Fan talk, Guo Fan talk about it. He learned from a Hollywood film, I forgot which one, probably Avatar. I think that kind of thing already been well established, very popular in Hollywood films, right? The animation, the virtual camera being the impossible camera. I remember, I think Guo Fan said he specific that shot, he would learn from a Hollywood films. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, this is specific, um, but I think he's very proud of it. It's like mm -hmm. something like he learned a trick from somewhere. Yeah, and I certainly don't see that film as evoking some Chinese aesthetic, but I do see it as, I mean, whether in Hollywood or in China, the filmmakers essentially have a choice of going with the graphical possibilities of the image to create cool images, good graphics, or going for a sort of photorealist look that that seems to be captured from a camera. Um, so certainly, I, I, they're, they're both possibilities. Then how do you think about them. even Lev Manovich already said almost all CGI film and animation. He certainly doesn't tell the difference between photorealistic and non-photorealistic. He basically just say, all digital cinema, the animation, which I think the argument was made quite earlier and even more radical than Chen Xihe, right? 
Yeah, no, I think Lev Manovich and Chen Shiha are, are basically making similar claims. And actually, I reject both of them as any sort of absolute claim, because I think uh, digital cinema, I, I don't believe that digital cinema as, as a medium is intrinsically anti-realist. And I don't agree that digital cinema in general uh, departs from realism and, and is necessarily going toward painting or an animated aesthetic. I just think it's one possibility for digital cinema. But certainly that claim for a fundamental break in the medium, in the aesthetics of the medium or the ontology of the medium is made by Western theorists like Lev Manovich and by Chinese critics like Chen Shiha. And, and I think both of them overstate the case if they're trying to say something about cinema in general, rather than maybe about a specific film or a specific technique. Any other question from the audience? Maybe I would like to just say if if anybody has um, thoughts or or suggestions of uh, sources that might be helpful, I would greatly appreciate just you can contact me by email and I would love to hear any thoughts or suggestions or recommendations for sources. Um, I, I don't think Zoom will have any questions. Um, many people just uh, come and listen, <laughs> just, uh, just uh, stay passive. Um, I, uh, maybe it's almost time. Um, maybe Jingyi, you can uh, wrap up? Uh, I'll wrap up, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for, for, for the talk. Um, yes, I, I think uh, in... in it's uh, it's I think probably it is more beneficial to read the whole book, and uh, um, I recommend everybody uh, uh, got the, the link. I, I think Jason, maybe you can send the put the link in the the free book link in the chat, yes, so yes. that we can actually oh, sure. you know give opportunity for people to read because a lot of the argument you seem to make already being in that book, and also thank you so much for. Uh, providing this wonderful um, analysis of Zhang Yimou's film and to make a thinking about the, the aesthetic differences between the Chinese CGI films with American one, the differences that you said cannot really be generalized and the different things are probably more contingent and more discursively constructed rather than real one. So I think it is very much inspiration for us thinking about the um, the historical legacy, continued historical legacy in Chinese cinema's effort to create this discursive uh, distinguishedness by referring to and going back to this quote unquote shadow of the tradition, shadow as Zhang Yimou imagined can be replicated without the original. So, um, so thank you so much. Uh, I, that's my um, sort of uh, wrapping up and uh, Thank you everyone for coming to the talk. And thank Daisy for inviting uh, Jason and me to uh, have this conversation. And um, it's very much a pleasure to participate in this event. Thank you and thanks to all. And I, I was about to paste the link in the chat, but the chat is disabled. Oh, <laughs> that's probably the reason nobody can. Yeah. The there. Oh, the chat is uh, disabled. Um, uh, let me At think. Least when I go to it, I'm not able to. Oh yeah, to... it is, it is. I cannot put it in there either. Yeah, um, it's fine. Uh, maybe later, Jason, I can just do low, maybe uh, publish a book review of your book because your book is related you know, to animation, the CGI part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I also want to mention that actually Jane produced a wonderful uh, book chapter about Stephen Cho's you know, martial arts films and oh, an yeah. animation. I see. So that's why I put you guys together. Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, the interesting part you think about Chinese film, uh, mostly animated, the film was chosen yes. primarily martial art film. I kind of, that's in my argument, martial art film does have historically um, aesthetic connection with animation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's how uh, I say your arguments, you know, can be linked together. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. And also thank you so much for uh, highlighting the uh, the genre of martial art in the film that this and actually uh, sort of uh, analyze as example of the animation tendency in CGI film. Yes, I think martial art probably is play a very important role in this uh, animation tendency in the CGI film. Yeah, I read your works together, <laughs> uh, uh, Jason's um, um, uh, book about realism, CGI, and Jean's chapter about Stephen Cho's martial arts films. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Li Jianying and Professor Jason Mike Grass. So hope we can continue the conversations you know, after, after the talk. Okay. Stay in touch. Thank you. All right. And thank okay. you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you, Jin Ying and Jason. Talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.